Uh, I am extremely excited because for the first time, my two of my grandsons and my daughter have came to our new building, our new church. So I am very excited about that. And you see those familiar faces over there that you haven't, probably haven't seen? <laughs> so I am over the moon because I didn't expect to see them. And when I was sitting there and I saw them come through the door, I had to contain myself because I was so surprised. And probably if someone was watching, I had a smile from ear to ear because I did not expect to see them today and I'm so happy to see them. Uh, and it's a blessing, you know, that they are here. And my little grandson, the first time, first time he saw me, I'm, he's, he, I'm his guy. So he's like, he's gotta come to me. So he, he ran to me and gave me a kiss and my youngest the same. So I am very happy that they're here. Uh, I wanna tell you, there's some rambunctious little boys. So if they get a little loud, blame it on their mother. <laughs> because <laughs> that's the only thing I can do in that situation. So I am glad that everyone is here. Uh, I know if you look at the title, uh, the title is A Reed Shaken in the Wind, the sermon title. And I hate saying sermon. I, I like to say the message, but it's a reed shaken in the wind. And I know a lot of you, you hear, you, you hear that title or you read that title and you think you know where we're going. You are correct but there's gonna be a turn at the end that you might not expect. So before we go any further, let's bow our heads and ask the Lord to be with us. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, Lord up in heaven, thank you for the many blessings that you give in everyday life. And Father, I, I am not a preacher. You know this, you know, you know me inside out, Lord. And I just ask that you take over, Lord, and, and you touch my lips and you bring things to remembrance for me that so I can preach your word with boldness, Lord, but only your word, not anything that comes from my lips, only that you want your people to hear, Lord. And I ask you to, if you will, take over, Lord, and lead this congregation. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. A reed shaken in the wind. I know that a lot of you are thinking this is going to be about John the Baptist. I know that most people, when they saw that, and you're sort of right, it's going to be about John the Baptist, but it's not focused on John the Baptist. And the main topic is not going to be on John the Baptist. And you'll see what I'm talking about as we get further into this message. Today, though, Let's start with a firm foundation of where we will be going. So let's start at Malachi chapter three. We're going to read Malachi three, starting at 16, and we're going to read all the way to Malachi four, six. And we're going to build a foundation to tell you where we're going and how we're going to get there. So let's start with verse 16, and I'll give a few minutes and then I'll start reading. It says, then they that feared the Lord spake often one to another, and the Lord hearkened and heard it. And the book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord, and that thought upon his name. And they shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts. And that day when I make up my jewels, I will spare them as a man spareth his own son that serveth him. Then shall ye return and discern between the righteous and the wicked, between him that serveth God and him that serveth him not. For behold, the day cometh that I shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. But unto you that fear my name shall the son of righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall, and ye shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. 
Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. In Malachi chapter three, verses 16 through 18, God is giving us a glimpse of his plan of salvation. The, prerequis the prerequisites have been set. Those of us who will follow him with all our hearts will be saved and those who won't will be condemned. In Malachi 4.2, there is a strange description that is only seen once in the Bible. And I don't know if you caught that when I was reading it. And I don't know if you caught this when you were reading through Malachi, but it says the son of righteousness shall arise. While the wicked are being destroyed by intense heat in verse one, the righteous receive healing from the same source of heat describes as the son of righteousness. We that believe will be preserved. In Malachi 4, it reminds us to remember the law of Moses. This is a challenge for Malachi's contemporaries as it is a challenge for us as well. Jesus says in John chapter 14, verse 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. Verse five and six concludes the book of Malachi with a promise of the return of Elijah the prophet. While most, most of us know that Elijah was taken to heaven without dying, this is not a reference to the person Elijah himself. Rather, this is the anticipation of the spirit of Elijah in John the Baptist. Matthew 11, chapter 14 says, Jesus said, if you are willing to accept it, he is the Elijah, the Elijah who is to come, referring to John the Baptist. These few verses are a look back and a look forward to the wonderful day of the Lord. His presence to redeem the earth from its sins and then his promise of his return to take us home. Elijah, when he left this earth, he had a servant and his name was Elijah. Elijah followed Elijah everywhere. And at the end, Elijah followed Elijah to the point where he was whisked away by a fiery chariot to heaven. Elijah kept trying to get Elisha to wait. He said, wait right here as I go further. And Elijah said, no, my master, I will follow you all the way to the end. This happened multiple times where Elijah was testing Elisha to see if he would just kind of casually hang out and wait. And then Elijah would have been whisked away to heaven and it would have been over. But Elisha would not leave Elijah's side. And because he followed Elijah and he followed God's word through Elijah, Elijah's mantle was left for Elisha. He left his mantle for Elisha. It says in 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 14, Elijah took hold of Elijah's ornament, ornamental cloak that had been left behind. So when Elijah, when Elijah left this earth, he gave something to Elisha so Elisha could pick up where he left off. When Christ rose from the dead, he gave us the opportunity to pick up our cross and follow him. For when the time comes, our righteousness will not be enough. Only the robe of righteousness that Christ affords us will we receive the gift of salvation. Amen. That's the only way. I submit to you that Christ gives us his mantle, his ornamental cloak on that great and dreadful day. Isaiah 61 10 says, I will heartily rejoice in the Lord. My soul will delight in my God for he has wrapped me in garments of salvation. He has arrayed me in a robe of righteousness just like a bridegroom, like a priest with a garland, and like a bride adorns herself with jewels. We will wear 
the robe of righteousness that is afforded to us through Christ Jesus. So it doesn't mean that you're not supposed to give your life to the Lord. It doesn't mean that you're supposed to walk in the Lord's ways. But whatever we do in this life, if it's not to the glory of God, then we will fail. But if we do things to the glory of God, God has made a promise that he is going to give us a robe of righteousness. So when we stand before the throne of God, we will be blameless because Christ was blameless. Now, when you were when we were reading through Malachi, you noticed uh, that it talks about the spirit of Elisha. I want to tell you that John the Baptist and Elijah had very similar attributes. They were very close in character. A lot of the things they did were the same. They were both men of the wilderness. They were both preparing the way for the Lord. They were both looking to turn Israel back to God. They were both convicting. They, had, they both had convicting words for a ruling class. And there are so much more if you look at these two men and you start to compare these two men. But today I wanted to focus on John, because if I tried to focus on John and Elijah, we would be here for hours. And I know some of you guys want to eat. I can focus on just John and we could be here for hours, but I'm just going to focus on certain little parts of John's life to get you to a finalization, to get you to a climax, to get you to a point that I want you to hear that is very important. So we're going to jump around a little bit in the Bible concerning John. But I want to start in the most, let me say the place where I think is the most obvious place. Let's start with John's birth. Doesn't that make sense? Zachariah being his father and Elizabeth being his mother, when John was about to be born, and if for you that, for those of you who don't know the story, Zachariah has been made to the point where he can't talk. He's not able to speak. And the reason that he's not able to speak is because he didn't believe the angel Gabriel when he told him that his wife would have a son or a child. So he was made dumb. He couldn't speak. So as this was happening, nobody even really knew what was going on with Zachariah and Elizabeth and what kind of child this would be. So they did. The people asked. They said, what kind of child? Will this be as Elizabeth is getting ready to deliver John? And we're going to turn our Bibles, everyone, turn your Bibles to uh, Luke 1, and we're going to start at chapter 67. And, there, and the question is answered here, what kind of child will this be, speaking of John the Baptist? Luke 1, verse 67. And it says, and his father, Zechariah, this is after John was born, and now his, his mouth has been loosened. He can speak again. And his father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Ghost and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited the, and redeemed his people, and hath raised up horn, a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. As he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us, to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which, which he swear to our father Abraham, that he might grant unto us that we being delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear, in holiness and in righteousness before him all the days of our lives. And thou, child shall be called the prophet of the highest for thou shalt go ahead or go before the face of the Lord to prepare his way to give knowledge of salvation unto his people by remission of their sins through the tender mercies of our God whereby the display the, the day spring from on high hath visited us to give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace and the child grew and waxed strong in spirit and was in the deserts till the day of his, show, his showing unto Israel. God has now given Israel the Elijah of their time. This child one day will prepare the world for Jesus. John grew and became a man. Uh, the Bible doesn't give a whole lot of the explanation about John. It doesn't say a whole lot about John's childhood it really doesn't say anything you have more information about Jesus's childhood than you have a John and you have this much about Jesus's childhood 
There's only one little story about what happened when Jesus was a child. There's no stories about what happened when John was a child. But it does say that John lived in the wilderness until he was presented to Israel. That's where he stayed, stayed in the wilderness. And then, boom, John showed up in Israel. And John was an overnight sensation. That's what people say about really famous people when they become popular. John was an overnight sensation. I'm sure the Israelites were saying, well, where's this guy John come from? He came out of nowhere. He's an overnight sensation. He's, re he's preaching to the people. He's baptizing. But they have no idea of his backstory. They have no idea of what he had to go through to get there. They no, have no idea of what was done for him to get there. John had the Holy Spirit since before his delivery into this world. You realize that? The Holy Spirit was in John before he was even delivered, because the reason we know that, that when, uh, when Elizabeth came and told Mary that she is with child as well, and Mary said, I am with child too, uh, he jumped, he flipped in her womb, in her belly, John the Baptist flipped around. I want you to remember that too, that John was made known about Jesus before he was born, and he rejoiced in his mother's womb. John wasn't an overnight sensation. God had to be with him, preparing him, keeping him in his word, and, and just keeping him on a steadfast path so he could lead the way for Jesus. John had the Holy Spirit since before delivery into the world, and I am sure the Lord was with him through childhood, preparing him, rearing him up, weaning him so he could lead Jesus. Here's a description of John. This is something that's funny to me. And it makes me laugh because I'm going to, I'll tell you why. Here's a description of John. Now, John himself is found in Matthew 3, uh, Matthew chapter 3, verse 4. Now, John himself was clothed in camel hair, was clothed in camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist. That's the description of John. He lived in the wilderness. So it makes sense that John's hair is probably long. He has a whole big old nasty beard. He's got on camel hair as a, as a cloak and he has a leather belt around his waist and all this stuff is probably homemade. It's probably all self-made. In the time of John, men were, that were considered authorities, they were dressed in fine clothing, They're having long robes, long phylacteries, coveting status and keeping their standards of the elites. But John walking around with camel skin on and a leather belt and the people listen to John. They listen to John in some cases more so than they listen to the Pharisees and Sadducees. It didn't matter his appearance. They were drawn to John because John preached the word of God boldly. He preached the truth about God's word boldly. Now, I brought this stool up here for a reason. I want everybody to see it. I'm gonna jump on my soapbox for a minute. And I just wanted to give you guys a, uh, what it looks like me jumping on my soapbox. So here I go. I'm stepping up on my soapbox. We have to be careful as believers. We can get caught up in appearances. This is why I'm on my soapbox. We can get caught up in appearances, even though what comes out of representative's mouth is the true word of God. I am not saying that we should not bring our best if we come to this pulpit or if we come to the church as leaders, or even if we are leaders. We should not worry about what someone is saying. We should not worry about what type of shoes they're wearing. We should not worry about what type of clothes they're wearing. A tie, and a jacket does not constitute truth. What comes out of a man's mouth is what constitutes truth. And if it's God's word and it has a continuity with God's word and it is, can be compared and it can be, it can be uh, looked at and said, this is true, then this doesn't matter what I'm wearing. Now, don't get me wrong. If someone came up to this pulpit with camel's hair 
clothing and a belt around their waist and all raggedy and long hair, I might have a problem with that. I'm going to be honest with you. But as of today, we do need to be careful that we don't judge people by what they wear. I went to a preaching seminar one time and a, and a gentleman walked out. He was the key speaker. He had on a leather jacket, a t-shirt and a pair of tennis shoes and jeans. And I was taken back. I'm going to be honest with you. I had a problem with that. I said, this man is coming up here and he preaching the Lord's word and look at how he dressed. He's, he's dressed like somebody's just walking up and down the streets. But when that man started to preach, I forgot all about that. So sometimes we need to be careful and stop worrying about what someone's wearing and start worrying about what's coming from their mouth. Now, if they're ridiculously dressed, then okay, we got a problem. But if they are dressed casually, and they're preaching the gospel, and it's the true gospel. We need to give it its respect, and we need to know that they are preaching the word. And also, I'll say this. We can be like the Bereans of old. We can check everything through the Bible and make sure that what we're hearing is the word of God. Now, I'm going to step off of my soapbox, and I'm going to move on. I think that's something that needed to be said, because I can see sneers sometimes of people and it's just not called for if the word of God is coming from their mouth. Turn your Bibles as we move on to Luke chapter three. We're going to start at verse two. Sorry, I hope I didn't offend anyone by saying that, but I think that's something that needs to be said. Luke chapter three, verse two. During the high priest Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. He went into all the country around the Jordan, preaching and baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah, the prophet, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. Every valley shall be filled in, every mountain and hill made low. The crooked roads shall become straight, the rough ways smooth, and all people will see God's salvation. John is trying to get the people to see that God is calling Israel to come back to him, repent and be baptized. The practice of baptism is a call of God. God called John out of the wilderness to preach repentance through baptism. This is an outward example of our commitment to God. And we all know that, that once you get baptized, you are outwardly committing that you love the Lord. Also, he's out here baptizing because something needs to happen that nobody knows about except for him, the Father, and Jesus. Jesus must be baptized. It says that Jesus must be baptized to fulfill all righteousness. Does Jesus need to repent? No, exactly. But this will be an example, as I said, for those who all come after him. This is a way that we bury the old man of sin when we get baptized and we emerge from the waters a new man in Christ Jesus. If we think about this, baptism is something that must be done to show that we follow Jesus. And we know through Romans that when you get baptized, the old man dies, the new man comes out and you're supposed to be a new creature. That's what's supposed to happen through baptism. So when you get baptized, you're following Jesus' step to the letter. It's important to understand that. Meanwhile, while the leaders noticed John baptizing, they sent messengers. They sent messengers. They want to know why John's baptizing. Who gave you the authority to do this? John answers them in such a way that cannot be conflicted. It's in John chapter one, turn your Bibles there, John chapter one, we're gonna start at verse 19. So the Pharisees and Sadducees come to John and they say, who are you and why are you baptizing? John's testimony went like this. And it says, verse 19, this was John's testimony when the Jewish leaders sent priests and descendants of Levi for, to him from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? He spoke openly and remaining true to himself, admitted, I am not the Messiah. So they asked him, well, then, are you Elijah? John said, I am not. Are you the prophet? John answered, no. So they said, who are you? They, they said, 
we must give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? Now they're trying to get John to condemn himself basically. And John replied, I am a voice calling out in the wilderness, prepare the Lord's highway as the prophet Isaiah said. These men had been sent by the Pharisees. They asked him, why then are you baptizing if you are not the Messiah or Elijah or the prophet? John answered them, I am baptizing with water, but among you stands a man whom you do not know, the, own, the who you do not know, the one who is coming after me, whose sandal straps I am not worthy to untie. John has given an answer for why he is baptizing. John is also saying that someone will come, someone will come after him that he doesn't even hold a candle to. Now, here's something that's extreme for me when I read this. And if you ever watched the Gospel of John, have you ever watched the movie The Gospel of John? It gives me goose, pimp, goose pimples every time this part happens. And it's, it's, so, it's such a fascinating thing. And I can see it as the way that it's done in the movie. John is talking to Andrew and Philip, having a conversation with them. And then here, Jesus comes on the scene. Jesus steps up to the plate. And what is what for me, John's account of the Lamb of God. The way that it's done in the movie, when Jesus steps up, the sun is behind him and it cascades around his head. And uh, John points to Jesus and he said, there is the lamb of God. I get goose pimples every time I hear that. There is the lamb of God. And when I read the account of that, there is the land of God. So now after the Pharisees and Sadducees had approached John to ask him who he was, it says in John chapter one, verse 29, we're staying in John one. It says the next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, look, the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And then John proclaims, this is the one about whom I said, after me comes a man who ranks above me because he existed before me. I didn't recognize him, but I came baptizing with water so that he might be revealed to Israel. John also testified that I saw the spirit coming down from heaven like a dove and it remained on him. I didn't recognize him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water told me the person on whom you see the spirit descending and remaining is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. I have seen this and I have testified that this, this is the son of God. Jesus showed up the next day after John was accosted by the Pharisees and Sadducees. You know, Jesus had the most powerful social network in the world. Jesus had the Lord himself. So the Lord hit his notifications and told him, you need to go down and take care of John right now because this is the time for your ministry to begin because the Pharisees and Sadducees are starting to recognize what John is doing and how John is preparing the way for Jesus. So it's now, now they are in fear of their status. They want, they're wanting to know who this man is. And the leaders are coming out to see him now. When the leaders come out to see John, I'm going to go back a little bit. When the leaders come out to see John, at first, this is what John has to say to the leaders. Old generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth, therefore, fruits, meet for repentance. And think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children under Abraham. And now also the ax is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which bringeth not good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. That's Matthew chapter three, verse seven and 10. Now think about all these things that are happening with John. Do you think John is making enemies in Israel? John is definitely making enemies in Israel. He made an enemy of Herod because he was telling Herod that this woman is, is unlawful for you to have this woman. So anyone that is, that is not for God is wanting, they're, they're looking to kill Herod. 
So, I mean, you're looking to kill John. So Herod is uh, looking for, he's laying in wait, waiting for a chance to get John. Israel, some of the enemies, the Pharisees and Sadducees are laying in wait, waiting to get John. That's a comparison to Christ because they lay in wait to get Jesus too. They all made a pact that they wouldn't, they would make sure that Jesus died. They wanted to put Jesus to death and they also wanted to put John to death. But because of Herod, John finally gets arrested. Now I went through Malachi, I went through John, I went through Matthew, I went through all this because I wanted to set up something for you, for you to see. John was a devout follower of God. There is no doubt about it. He started in the beginning, he had this Holy Spirit forget in the beginning. The fact that he was born was to lead the way for Jesus. It was the fact that he was born. I took you through there for a reason because I want you to understand something. I want you to see something. And if you have not heard me up to this point, this part I want you to hear. I would say that this is huge. I'm going to take a few minutes for dramatic effects. Oh, thank you. <laughs> This man's whole sole purpose was to prepare the way for the Messiah. But here's the part I want you to hear. John had doubts. Do you believe that? John had doubts. Because when John was in prison, John sent messengers to Jesus to ask him questions. Did you hear what I said about John in the beginning? and what his job was and what he had done and how he had been baptizing people and telling them that there was somebody that was going to come after him, that shoes he was not uh, worthy to untie and that he was his life was in danger because he was promoting Christ. He was, he was saying stuff to the Pharisees and Sadducees that were making them feel terrible. He was making Herod feel like garbage. And then he had doubts. Here is the reason why this is so important. I submit to you that you are no different than John the Baptist, the greatest prophet that was ever born of women. Come on now, let's be honest. Do you have doubts sometimes? Do, does your faith waver sometimes? You are no different than the greatest prophet that was ever born from a woman. But John said, John sent messengers to Christ. And this happened in the Bible in chapter Matthew, I mean, in chapter, in the book of Matthew, chapter 11, verse 2. Turn there. Let's see what his answer is. We'll see what John's having doubts. And let's see what Jesus says to John when he sends messengers to John, uh, to Jesus. John sends messengers to Jesus. When John, who was in prison, heard about the deeds of the Messiah, he sent his disciples to ask him, are you the one who is to come or should we expect someone else? I want to stop right there for a second. Should we expect someone else? What did John testify when he baptized Jesus? That he was told that when he was going to baptize this certain person, that there was going to be a presence that came down from heaven and it would land on him and stay on him. And this is the man that is my son. Didn't God say, this is my son who I am well pleased? Didn't John hear that? John's still bringing this question. John still wants to know. To me, it blows me away. So in verse four, Jesus replied, go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the good news is proclaimed to the poor, blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. As, Jan as John's disciples were leaving, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed swayed by the wind? If not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No. Those who wear fine clothes are kings and palaces. Then what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes. I tell you, and more than a prophet, this is the one about whom it is written. I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare you 
you, who will prepare your way, who will prepare your way before you. Truly, I tell you, among those born of women, there has not risen any one greater than John the Baptist. Yet whoever is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until the kingdom of heaven has been subjected to violence and violent people have raided it for all the prophets and the law prophesied until, until John. And if you are willing to accept it, he is the Elijah who was to come. Whoever has ears, let him hear. These words are for you just as much as they're for John. John was busy preparing the way for the Lord. John went before the Lord. He made straight paths for him. He, met, he got the people ready for Jesus to come. And guess what John did after Jesus got there? Did he hang around and say, well, let me see what this dude is doing? No, John kept moving forward and kept preparing the way. So he never had an opportunity. He only heard word of mouth what Jesus was doing. He never had an opportunity to stand there and watch the miracles. He never had the opportunity to watch Jesus raise people from the dead. He ever ne never had an opportunity to heal the sick, to see all that. So what did John have to have to understand what his mission was? He had to have faith. He had to have faith. Because he didn't see any of this. It was all through eyewitnesses who told him. It was all through the messengers who gave him these, these words through the mouth of these other people. The same way that John is getting ready to be told from the messengers that he had sent that this is the one. John the Baptist had to have faith. So you, as people of God, you as believers are no different than John the Baptist. You have to have faith. You have eyewitnesses in the gospel. You have Paul. You have the Old Testament. You have so much to prove to you that Christ is the Messiah. If someone like John has doubts, then you're not wrong for having some doubts. You're not wrong for thinking, well, maybe this isn't right. Maybe, maybe, I, need to, maybe I need to pull back and think about what I'm doing because I'm giving my whole life to this. You're not, you're not any different. But what I would say is John was reassured by what he heard. You need to do your research. You need to be reassured of what you're hearing. You need to know that God is real and Jesus was real. You need to research the Bible. You need to research history. You need to look at eyewitnesses account, read eyewitnesses, uh, eyewitness accounts. You know that there are people who are not Christians who wrote about Jesus Christ. That you can you can have an account of the fact that Jesus Christ was here and he did everything that, that is said in the Bible that he did. You have to have faith. John believed, get this, listen to this part. John believed in the testimony of Jesus. When those messengers went back, where did he get that, where did he get that message from? It was from Jesus. And they gave him the testimony of Jesus. Where have you heard that before? I'm going to tell you where you heard that before. In Revelation chapter 12, verse 17, it says, the dragon became angry with the woman and went away to do battle against the rest of her children. The ones, the children being you, the ones who keep God's commandments. We talked about that Jesus wants us to keep his, he wants us to keep his commandments. And it says so in Matthew 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. If the, and the testimony about Jesus. The testimony about Jesus. This is where John the Baptist's faith is coming from. I'm not going to give you the whole story about John the Baptist because you, you need to read the Bible and figure it out for yourself and find out what happens to John the Baptist. I know that everyone knows, or at least I think they do. But look and see what happens to John the Baptist. But John the Baptist, just like you, he had to have faith. Jesus said to John the Baptist, I am he. We have two witnesses that prove that Jesus is who he says they are, he, he is, and it's the Old Testament and the New Testament. We have eyewitness accounts of the life of Jesus. We have testimonies from our brothers and sisters, even today. You can talk to some of your brothers and sisters that are sitting next to you today to give account of the realness of their experience of how Jesus changed their lives. Miracles. I'll say it again, and I can't say it enough. You got a, you got a miracle sitting right here. 
every single day that you've heard preach sermons, that you've heard do Sabbath school. This man was blown up and he prayed while it was happening and he's still here today. You have that opportunity to hear how God has changed lives. Are you struggling to believe? I say this to young people and all of you, I'm older than most of you too now, so I can say this, I'm saying this to you all, even the ones that are my age or old. There is no doubt that there is an ultimate evil in this world. His name is Satan. Then doesn't it stand to reason that there's an ultimate good? His name is Jesus. In Romans chapter five, verse 20, as I'm closing, it says, where sin increased, grace increased the more. So while sin is abundant around you, grace is even more abundant. And we need to partake in the grace. We need to partake in the good. We need to study and learn and cure our doubt and our unbelief. Don't feel bad if you, if you question sometimes. I can't, you know, when I, I was going over this and just thinking John question, I, it just doesn't make any sense to me with all that he went through and with all that he, he witnessed, but he still had doubts. So I say to you, you can be a modern day Elijah. You can be like John the Baptist. Actually, the Bible says that there will be Elijah's in the end time. Do we have an Elijah in this room? I really believe that we had an Elijah standing at this pulpit a few weeks ago, and his name is Tyler. Do we have Elijahs in this room? I really believe we do. But it's up to us to accept it, believe it, and carry on. I want to be a modern-day Elijah. I want to be like John the Baptist. We might not have the experience that John the Baptist had watching the Holy Spirit come down and descend on Jesus, but I'd like to I'd like to be like John the Baptist, and I hope you would too. So I will say this as my closing word, make straight paths for the Lord to travel. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for the opportunity to preach this message. Lord, I hope, I hope, Lord, that I did not confuse. I hope, Lord, that I did not send people uh, astray. I hope I did not scatter, but I hope I gathered together, Lord. I hope that, your, that the word that came from my mouth helped people to understand that it's about love, it's about believing, and it's about rejoicing in the fact that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. Yes, Lord, we will have doubt, and you know this, but you gave us the opportunity with all the witnesses that you gave us for us to come to a conclusion that you are real and that your promises are real and that you're coming again and that we can have the gift of eternal life. All we have to do is believe. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for everything you do. And I ask you, Lord, to please forgive everyone in this room and all our members in this community. Forgive them for their sins. And thank you, Lord, for your forgiveness. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. It's time for our closing song.